Good evening and welcome to Arizona Illustrated for Wednesday, May 2nd, 2012. I'm Christopher Conover, sitting in for Tony Paniagua. The Tucson Unified School District is the largest in our area, and the head of the district wants to hear from you about making things better. Joining us now in the studio is TUSD Superintendent Dr. John Petticone, who's here to talk with us about a new community survey. Dr. Petticone, thanks so much for coming in. Oh, thanks, Christopher, for the invitation. Now, the district has had this survey up on the web for about two weeks. What do you want people to do with it? Well, we're asking the community to take a look at what we've developed internally in terms of what we believe the principles are that we need to abide by to become a district that this community deserves. And the internal information was rich. We ended up with about 15 principles that, uh, that, uh, the, that the internal constituency believes are important. Now we want our community to react to those, tell us if we're on target, what are the five priorities that they see of the 15 that they think are most important? And then there's a space for open comments to get at what are the things that we've missed and what are the things we need to do in order to really get to be the, a number one district in Arizona and certainly a district that represents the ideals and the expectations of this community. As we said, the survey's been up for about two weeks. It will be up until May 11th, so people still have time, and obviously you want people to go and spend some time on it. But have you taken a peek of uh, yeah. what people are saying so far? I couldn't have not done that, you know. And so we, we have uh, a little over 700 responses, which we are, are beginning now to escalate as people begin to realize that this thing is online, and it's really an easy survey to access and also an easy survey to complete. And we took a look at what are some of the things that are coming through in terms of priorities. And interestingly, it's not going to be anything that will surprise, I, I don't think, anyone. And that the number one priority that, uh, that people feel is, should be what we are about is student achievement. So they expect that of us, and we expect that of ourselves. The second is something that's not also, is also not surprising, and that's safety. They expect that when their students come to school that they're safe in a variety of different ways, not just physically, but emotionally and in other ways. And the third one is, is one that didn't surprise me at all, um, and that's, that's deep levels of communication and transparency. It's one of the issues that I think we struggle with when we're in a large organization. Um, it's been my belief, and I think our belief as a team, that you, we've got to make big small, and the way you do that is by creating relationships and having people feel they can have access, not just to leadership, but to the district as a whole, and that there's a response back on that when people have ideas. We can kick back a response to say what you're listened to, and, and we, understand, we understand what you expect of us. Let's see if we can't do it. So in two weeks or so, you get all this information. Now what do you do with it? Yeah, that's, that's going to be what this is all about, and that's to create what we hope will be a vision that has relevance and significance for, for us. It will, along with, by the way, I believe, a set of values that will guide the decisions we make and the way in which we make them. So the open-ended part of the survey, to me, is extremely important because we're going to get from the community the things we might have missed. Uh, what didn't we include in the, in, the, in the portion of the survey that's quantitative that they can click on and say, do we agree or not? And so then it's a matter of getting, catching the themes from that data and then creating not just a statement that sits on a shelf someplace, but really a, a look at where we need to head, where, where do we need to go, as well as some, some ways in which we need to get there. And I think it's going to be a real neat guiding process for us to be able to con convince the community that we're serious about making the change that's necessary. And so that's the, going to be the task ahead of us. In that open-ended section, are you hearing sp about specifics yet, specific programs, specific ideas, or is it all still very general? I th for me right now, I haven't taken a good look at the, at the, at the qualitative data because there's a, there's a lot of it, so that will remain to be seen. But I would, expect that people would, I would expect that people would be saying things like they would in in expect increased levels of service. You know, I, I was a, I'm a parent. I had students in school. Um, I, I expected the school to respond to me in ways where when I went to a front office, I, w I felt like I was welcomed. When I, when I look at different areas where they've got to access information, in a place, especially a place as large as ours, easy for people to be able to understand where to go and how to get the right kinds of answers for them. So I would expect that that's going to come through. And then I would hope the other things that come through is, is an expectation that we serve the community in ways where we're doing our job and doing it well. Um, no excuses for, you know, we're all going to make mistakes. That's going to happen, that we're transparent when it comes to those mistakes. But we do something about it. And so I'm expecting those kinds of comments to come forward. Let's talk about some good news in the district. Uh, C.E. Rose Elementary mm -hmm. ranked as one of the top schools in the country, I guess. Uh, and some people may be surprised by that because so many, uh, I believe it's over 90% of the kids 
are on uh, free lunch there. So obviously not the highest social economic area, but one of the top schools. You know, we're so proud of CE Rose. And I think what we're really proud of is that we've had strong leadership there. We've had a community that embraces that school, and, and it's been going on for, for a long time. You may remember that the Rotary Clubs of Tucson kind of a, adopted CE Rose years ago, and then CE Rose hit kind of a, a, of a difficult time as it was trying to progress to get better. And uh, in came a, a, you know, the Steve Trejo I've got great respect for. I've, I've, I've called him uh, an organizational pain because he, he refuses to allow anything that's short of what's he expects in his school to take place. And so leadership, a staff that is just remarkable in their commitment to doing the work. So when we see that school getting, being one of the top seven schools in the nation uh, uh, for urban school success, and then you look at a, a school like University High School that's one of the top ten high schools in the nation, and then we realize that everything in between, we have models to, to use to be able to get our schools to achieve and perform, and people should expect that of, of every one of our schools, and we do. We certainly do. Achievement data coming out uh, pretty soon. I know predictions are a dangerous thing, but do you have a feeling one way or another? Yeah, you know, we, honestly, I think we put in place the right things to make that happen. And, and uh, there are a number of us that have been involved in this kind of work before. Um, one of the things you have to do is, is build instruction. So we've, we've trained over 4,000 teachers and administrators in an instructional decision-making model that will pay off. It just simply is. That's what makes the difference in the classroom. Additionally, every one of our schools, uh, elementary through senior high, have taken on a school improvement strategy, and, and it's specific to using data from previous years, looking at the achievement of individual students and then working to improve that achievement. If this doesn't yield the results we hope it will, then what I'm encouraging principals and staffs to do is not be overly discouraged because what it tells us then is that what we've tried, just like any good business, you know, businesses and entrepreneurs look at the reality of, of what the, some would call failure, others would call opportunities, to look at what didn't work so that we can move forward to what did. So there's nothing my, to my mind other than a sense of hopefulness. If people work hard, we're doing the right work, we will, we, we will see in the end results that we expect. It may take a little longer than we hope it will, but I'm, I'm confident that this spring people are going to see a difference. Of course, some of this data comes in uh, school by school. What, what do the schools do? What do you at the top of the district do with this school by school data? I mean, obviously, it's a lot of numbers and a lot of information. The only way you use data effectively is to, is to, is to disaggregate it down to the finest level you can so that we're looking at it, we're literally the individual student and the competencies that student needs in order to be successful. And we have that ability now. Um, we're, we're putting systems in place to get even better at that. Uh, Tucson Unified has done so many things well over time. There's a misconception that this district has failed on all levels. It simply has not. One of the things that it's done is to create a, an, an accountability and research area where we can actually get at that data. Many districts can't do that. We've had data for a long time. So one can ask, well, why hasn't that resulted in, in the results you would expect it would? And really it's because of the way you use it. So what we're doing is we're looking at the data. We're more effectively, I think, looking at how do, we, how do we bring that data down to the student level and then give teachers an opportunity to look at what their performance looks like with the students that they care about, and then we can make improvements and adjustments from there. So that's what's going on. It, it, it has to lead to improved achievement. I really believe it will. All right. Well, Dr. Petticone, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us, and we'll put a link to the survey up on our website so all of our viewers can get there. Thanks, Richard, very much. Thanks. Arizona, like a number of other states, is looking to opt out of certain requirements of the federal No Child Left Behind Act. Our sister station, KAET in Phoenix, takes a look at what, when it comes to education, the state is doing right and what's not going so well. Arizona is seeking a waiver to opt out of parts of No Child Left Behind, the federal program designed to improve education by measuring student progress and holding schools accountable. State officials say the federal requirements are too restrictive, and by opting out of those regulations, Arizona will have more freedom to do its own thing. Here to talk about what Arizona is doing and what it should be doing to improve public education is State Representative Heather Carter, a Republican from North Phoenix. She's a former public school teacher who's now a clinical associate professor at ASU's Teachers College, and Joe Thomas, 
also a former teacher who now serves as vice president of the Arizona Education Association, the state's largest teachers union. Thank you both for joining us on Horizon. Uh, Representative Carter, tell us what's going on here in terms of this opportunity to opt out of No Child Left Behind. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me here today. So historically, we have had No Child Left Behind um, passed down from the federal government for approximately 10 years now. And on face value, it sounded like a good idea because the rhetoric was No Child Left Behind. But what we've seen over the last 10 years is that it really truly was an unfunded mandate on the states, and it created a lot of duplicate um, systems in place for things that we're trying to do right in Arizona, and then we try to meet the federal mandates that are associated with No Child Left Behind, and sometimes that creates a confusing system. So if we're able to show leadership in four particular areas, we, have, we will be able to apply for and hopefully win a waiver from many of the No Child Left Behind and requirements. I understand 11 states already have yes, obtained the waiver. 26 more are, are, are asking for one, mm-hmm. and that includes Arizona. Well, what will we be doing in its place? Well, we support the superintendent, John Hoopenthal, in uh, requesting the waiver from AYP. And we have always had, uh, or at least as long as No Child Left Behind has been around, we've had a state system called Arizona Learns. And it measures uh, students now uh, and schools based on student growth, which is a much more accurate measurement than how well they do on one test on one particular day, which is what adequate yearly progress or AYP did from the, from the federal No Child Left Behind. Um, and so what you, end up, what you end up getting is a much more reliable system of data that you can use to see how schools are doing. AYP had one way that you could be successful and over 100 ways that you could fail. That's not fair to schools. That's not fair to the hard work that teachers and support staff are doing in our schools every day and the, the leadership that our principals are showing. So we will be using the Arizona Learns uh, system as we always have. And again, we'll have one label now that parents will be able to see uh, and, and read how well their, their child is doing in school. And when we talk about labels, we're talking about a series of grades. Is that? Yes, that's, that's um, uh, we've, we've moved. Uh, we're transitioning to it right now. It is uh, an A through F accountability system. Um, and, and those are pretty powerful la- labels in the education community. And uh, it's, it's important for parents to understand how well their, their students are doing, how well their schools are doing. Uh, we're very concerned about uh, misuse of that data in case people want to begin to really uh, try to move that down to, to say you can, you can rank teachers that way. Uh, I don't think we have that formula yet. Uh, and again, the move to Arizona Learns on a student growth formula is a move in the right direction. And, and hopefully over the years, we'll perfect that to where we can really get down granularly to see what is working in schools and we can spread those best practices to other districts. And Representative mm-hmm. Carter, labels is a big concern of yours. Yes. And, and, and so I take it you support this relabeling this, this new opportunity. Is there any concern, though, that, that this will lessen the accountability, which was such a big part of No Child Left Behind, the rationale for it? And, and make it easier for schools not to perform as well as they should? Well, that's a very good question, and, and a lot of people have asked that question because specifically you have to do four things as a state to demonstrate mastery um, in four areas. And number one, we have to have career and college-ready standards in place, which we do in Arizona. We're part of the new Common Core standards. We're moving to the, the park assessment here within the next two years. We also have to show that we have an accountability system that's in place and working. We have to show that we evaluate teachers and principals based on student data, which we are currently doing. And um, the fourth piece to it is that we are showing that we are reducing duplicative and overly burdensome regulation on our schools and districts. So if we meet all four of those criteria, then we will receive the waiver. So it's kind of um, in contrast to if we opt out, we don't have to do it anymore. We're actually showing that we are doing it. Therefore, we don't have to abide by duplicate, duplicative and overly burdensome uh, national regulation. So for example, let's take how we label schools right now. A school last year essentially could have received four different labels. It could have been labeled a performing school. It might have also received a letter grade of a C. It might not have made AYP, and it could have been labeled persistently low achieving. Well, as a parent trying to decide where do I want to send my children to school, that's really complicated. And so what you want is basically a a simple system to say, this school is doing great work with children, and this is where I want to send my kids. And so if we're able to show leadership in these areas, which I think we will be able to do, the federal government will most likely grant us the waiver. 
And then also, furthermore, we are going to then streamline our system in Arizona for how we label schools. So originally when we put forth the school labels on, on the letter grades, the A, B, C letter grades, we said we were going to phase out the legacy system, the high achieving and excelling labels and so forth. But there's a bill in the legislature this session to actually go on ahead and remove those legacy labels so that we don't have this confusing system for parents. I want to talk about another aspect of the criteria for getting the waiver and also uh, one of the things you mentioned in, in your list of things that we need to do, teacher evaluation. You've got a bill on that. Well, I specifically do not have a bill, but I am signed on to Representative Doris Goodale. She is the education chairwoman in the House, and she has a bill that addresses the teacher evaluation. Now, remember, two years ago, we did pass Senate Bill 1040, which put in place the teacher evaluation system, and we're in the process of phasing that in. What this bill then, this session does, is take it to the next step, and we look at how we will be able to identify those teachers who are doing great things in the classroom and those teachers who may need additional support and professional development. Joe, is there any concern from, from the teachers' uh, union about these kinds of, of this kind of legislation, teacher evaluation? No, teachers welcome high standards. I mean, we want ourselves and our colleagues to be measured very highly and, and held to high standards. Um, this particular bill started out as one that really targeted teachers. And um, to, to Representative Goodell's credit, and then over in the Senate, Representative Crandall's, they held stakeholder meetings to bring in superintendents, to bring in uh, school board members, to bring in parents, to bring in the association, AEA, to really work about crafting it to where it targeted teaching. And that's really what an evaluation should do. Evaluation is, is a, a method where you come into a classroom as, a, as a, a, an evaluator, as an administrator typically, and you watch an entire lesson and you see what is working well and maybe what could be improved upon. And then you have a conversation with the teacher after that to say, here's what I saw that I think you're doing really well, because teachers want that feedback. That's going to help them become a better teacher. And here's things I think you need to strengthen, and, and here's a plan that we can implement maybe on how you can do better at that. And that targets teaching, and that's what an evaluation should do. And that's where this bill is now after the stakeholder group met. And it met uh, four or five times for several hours. I mean, it was a pretty arduous process. But that's what we have always said is going to end up with better bills, is if you can bring the stakeholders in, if you can bring all the impacted people in to have the discussions, the best ideas are going to rise to the top. And we felt like we really improved this bill by the time we're where it is teachers, now. Another piece of legislation that, that's out there has to do with alternative routes yes. to teacher certification. Let's talk about that quickly. And that one is my bill. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, historically in Arizona, as provided by a No Child Left Behind, we were required to create an alternative route to certification, which we did many years ago. And what that original concept was, was we took existing statute that was already in place, specifically the intern certificate, and redefined it to allow teachers who, or for people who wanted to re-career into teaching, a more streamlined process to become a teacher. This bill that I'm proposing this session, which actually just passed out of the Senate and is awaiting the governor's signature, actually creates a brand new teaching certificate in the STEM areas. So science, technology, engineering, and math. And the crux of the bill is basically says, if you're teaching chemistry, let's say, in either a community college or a university, you should be able to teach high school chemistry. That's not the way it is in state statute right now. So what we're doing is creating a path that says, if you have shown that you are able to be a capable teacher at the higher, in higher education, you're able to drop down and then teach in our secondary classrooms. So this would provide more teachers. Absolutely, yeah, and these I'm are in critical areas. We still have jobs that are unfilled in science, technology, and math all across our state. And on that note, we're going to have to end the interview. Thank you both for joining us, Representative Carter, Joe Thomas. Thank Thanks you. for joining us on Horizon. Earlier this week, we asked you whether or not you thought Arizona was a swing state in this year's presidential election. It seems like a split. Nearly a third of the answers were yes, a third of you said no, Arizona's a red state and that won't change, and a third of you said you weren't sure. Thanks for taking the time to answer our question. Next time on Nature. The most surprising thing about crows has been their ability to recognize particular faces. And remember the deeds we've done to them, be they good or bad, for a long period of time. You walk outside now with a whole nother perspective. They're watching you and learning from you. Tonight at 8 on PBS HD, Arizona Public Media. In today's modern world of computers, smartphones, and other sophisticated gadgets, some educators are relying on an ancient game as a valuable tool for learning and critical thinking. 
Next, Tony Paniagua speaks to a group in Tucson that opens doors to many different children by introducing them to the world of chess. Tony spoke to them recently ahead of their major public event this Saturday, May 5th. I am joined by Varga Luna Michard. She is eight years old and has been playing chess for approximately half of her lifetime. And G. Hoffman is the executive director of Nine Queens. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Gina, if, if we could begin with you, what is Nine Queens all about? What is your mission? So Nine Queens is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to empowerment through chess. We use chess as an educational tool to promote critical thinking, problem solving, and increase cognitive abilities. And you are celebrating a special anniversary this year? Yes, this is the fifth anniversary of the organization and of an annual event, Chess Fest. Okay, we'll ask you about Chess Fest in a few minutes, but let's uh, go to you now, Varga. So you are only eight years old. When did you become interested in this game, and what are some of the things you like about it? I became interested when I was about four, and I like it because you get to have fun, you get to learn some things, and the things that you learn are you get to be more patient, you get to focus and concentrate on what you are doing, and, and it's about sportsmanship too. Fantastic. And Jean, why chess? Uh, in today's modern technology or modern world with so much technology, everybody's talking about computers and things like that. Why do you feel that it's a good idea to concentrate on this game? Um, well, chess is an incredibly powerful educational tool. Studies show that it's been proven to increase math and reading scores. Um, it promotes emotional intelligence, but it's also a tactile game and it's competitive. And when people play chess, they experience that chess can, and thinking can be fun. And you were saying that you typically try to work with some, quote, non-traditional students uh, when it comes to the, this game, why so? Um, yeah, we're trying to, our mission really is to extend the benefits of chess to those who might not necessarily consider playing the game. There are a lot of stereotypes about chess players. People feel like the game may be nerdy, they may think that it's just for boys. Um, and so part of what we do at Nine Queens is we try and give chess a makeover and make it exciting and appealing to a broader population. And part of that broader population is a little eight-year-old girl like you, Varga. Who do you play with and what do people say when they see you and they say, wow, you can play chess and you've been playing for four years? Well, I, I play people at my school because a lot of kids at my school like to play chess and some of them are girls, so that's good. And we have little, little after school things and on Wednesdays we do the after school chess camp. And what and are your favorite parts of the game? What are some of the things that you like to concentrate on when you are playing chess with somebody else? I like to concentrate on what I'm doing and what they're trying to do to checkmate me and you have to like focus on what you're doing and what they are doing. Okay, and Jean, we have uh, or you have a Nine Queens uh, special event coming up soon on Saturday, May fifth. What is that all about, please? Um, so it's our fifth annual Chess Fest, and it is not your typical chess tournament or event. It's going to be held on May fifth from two to five at the Hotel Congress. Um, and in addition to having a range of activities for chess players, people who have played in tournaments. A large portion of the event is designed for what I call closeted chess players, people that maybe played a long time ago, or people who have never played but might want to learn. Okay, and Varga, so is it easy or difficult to get started and to get better? Because I've never actually played, but I've watched a lot of people playing, and I'm one of those people, perhaps, Gene, that thinks that it might be too hard to learn. How would you describe the game? Well, I would describe it. Well, when you're first starting to learn, it feels like there's some it's something you've never heard about before. And and it it might seem a little hard to like get how the pieces move, so you need somebody to show you. And it's easier when you're 
when you get the pieces and and it's it's some when you get better and better at chess sometimes it if you're in a tournament it, it they give you people who it's difficult and difficult to on how how good you are and and when in tournaments Okay, and then finally, Jean, if somebody hasn't tried it, what would you say to him or her? Uh, we would encourage them to come out to the Chess Fest on Saturday. Um, there will be free chess lessons um, and something for everyone. Um, we ha will have chess arts and crafts, um, but beginner-friendly chess lessons so that even if you're four or any age, you could learn how to play. Okay, thank you very much, and good luck with the Chess Fest on Saturday, May 5th. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. The Taco Festival is an annual gathering of local restaurant chefs and amateur chefs who compete to see who has the best tacos in town. People come to enjoy the great tacos, entertainment, and just have a good time. Videographer Santiago Bati brings us tonight's postcard. You can get more news and information on our website, azpm.org. You can also comment on stories you saw tonight, click on them online, and go to the bottom of the page. We can also be reached via Facebook and Twitter. Coming up tomorrow night, we'll talk about civility with the members of the Arizona Town Hall, and we'll also hear about the Folk Festival this weekend. I'm Christopher Conover. Have a good night.